It was in the wee hours of the morning of May 14th, um, 2006. I got a call from my mom and uh, I knew something was wrong immediately just because of what time it was. And she told me that my younger brother Chris had been shot. I remember getting there and the paramedics already had him in the ambulance. And uh, one of the paramedics was coming out of the, the house. I guess he'd gone back in to get all of his equipment. And, you know, I asked him if he, he was gonna be okay. And I'll never forget it. He wouldn't look me in the eyes. And um, he said, we'll do the best we can. And when he said that, I knew, like I knew at that moment, that what was going to happen. I walked around to uh, the ambulance, and the back door was still open, and I looked in. And, um, he was breathing so hard, like, I just remembered how aggressively he was breathing and his chest going up and down, and I just couldn't comprehend that. It was, it just looked so aggressive. The first nurse came in and, and told us, you know, it was pretty dire. And, um, he immediately went into surgery and shortly after that, the doctor came in and told us that he had passed away. And uh, hearing my mom uh, well out like she did, it just, I won't ever forget her screaming out. I've never heard something like that come out of my mom and and it and it just it just you know was to my core just painful just hearing that and I'll never forget it oh. I found that people will drive up to like two hours to do it. Okay. So that's that's a covers a lot of a lot of ground when you get. Yeah, if you have one in Detroit, you have one in Grand Rapids, you'd cover yeah. three quarters of the state. Crazy thing is, I already have like four or five in Texas. Okay. Like they were just ready to go. <laughs>
can hop the train if I need to. Um, let me stop here just for now. I'll see if Kaz can take that. Boom. So the prophets in the Bible have this vision they give, uh, this image of God's people beating their swords into plows, their spears into pruning hooks, turning the instruments that have brought death into instruments that can bring life, this beautiful transformation. And it ends with by saying that uh, people will study violence no more and that people will play the kids can play in the streets we can live in a in a in a world that's safe uh, and and i love that image that, that's kind of what uh, provoked this uh, this whole movement of converting guns into plows uh, and, and and for me um, i think i got into this because uh, gun violence became personal so raw tools started in 2013 soon after the sandy hook shooting at the elementary school and before that we've been thinking about what raw tools would look like and what what do you do when you have a gun and how do you turn it into a garden tool and so we kind of got caught up in the logistics but when kindergartners are killed then you kind of you take the initiative and you um, you kind of go to work and so what we we found a connection that uh, worked on some of our equipment at our family business and turned out he was a blacksmith since he was a teenager so we we went to his shop and he showed us how to make a garden tool in like four hours and and from there on it was okay now how do we get all the guns that became personal for me when we heard the gunshots uh, um, one night and I, I ran outside and, and saw a young man fall in front of my house I'm five feet from my front door and he was still alive so I was holding his hand uh, praying for him and um, obviously we called an ambulance and I'm, I'm sitting there holding his hand the ambulance comes and takes him away and then uh, the next morning we found out that he, he didn't make it and he was 19 years old and his name uh, was Papito after Papito died that Easter, we had our um, Good Friday services on the Friday before Easter in front of the gun shop uh, around the corner. So it was hundreds of us and the young guys in my neighborhood uh, carried the cross, a giant cross, and we put it in front of the gun shop. And after the, the gospel readings, we had the women from our neighborhood come and share the stories of losing their kids. And there was something transcendent that happened where the tears of those mothers 2,000 years ago met the tears of the mothers on our street and um, the, the Calvary met Kensington. You know, the suffering of Jesus met the suffering of Papito and of the young men and women in our, our neighborhood. And after that service, this woman came up to me and she's got tears rolling down her face. She said, I, I get it, I get it. And I said, what? And she said, I understand something today that I've never understood like this before. And she said, God knows what it feels like to lose your child. And I realized it was Papito's mom. That's the gospel, that God understands our pain. Jesus came, was born a refugee, died on a cross, suffered from violence to triumph over violence. And, and God is suffering with the mothers that are losing their kids right now. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Through our lives and by our prayers, May your kingdom come. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This day marks the martyrdom of Dirk Willems. Willems is one of the most celebrated martyrs in the Anabaptist tradition, which includes Mennonites, Brethren, and Amish. He was born in the Netherlands and lived during a tumultuous time in Christendom. He is most famous for escaping from prison and turning around to rescue one of his pursuers who had fallen through the thin ice of a frozen pond while chasing him. He was burned at the stake on May 16, 1569.
Within the Christian church, there's always been a thread of Christians who have wanted to bring the church back to the original teachings of Jesus that focused on peace and enemy love and nonviolent resolution of conflict. That really exploded, though, in the 1500s. About 500 years ago, there was this Reformation called the Protestant Reformation who protested the Catholic Church, and, and, and they really championed the Bible, getting people to read the Bible for themselves. On the heels of the Protestant Reformation, then you have what's known as the Radical Reformation. They were really the students of the Protestants who were reading the Bible for themselves, and as they were reading it, they were saying, hey, wait, you guys aren't going far enough in your Reformation. You're calling people back to the Bible, but you're not calling people back to Jesus specifically. And we're reading the Bible for ourselves, and we are seeing that Jesus leads us into a new way of living. The Anabaptists, as they became known, the radical reformers then, accused both the Protestants and the Catholics of missing the key part that Jesus plays in forming our ethics and how we relate to one another and our lifestyle. You see, you had a time then when both Protestants and Catholics were killing one another in wars and also as heretics, they were torturing each other. The church was violent in both its Catholic and Protestant form. And so the radical reformers said no to all of this, which actually meant that they became the enemies of both Protestants and Catholics, and both churches killed Anabaptists. So the radical reformers were then slaughtered wholesale by the thousands because of their beliefs in following Jesus. There is a new wave of Anabaptists, a new rise of radical reformers who are re rediscovering their voice to say, no, we need to call the Christian church back to Christ himself. And Christ is not just the Savior who dies on the cross, but the way he dies is instructive for us in how we live today and in how we die. That we serve the King who was crowned with a crown of thorns, a crown of suffering, that he did not reject when he ascended to his throne, which is the cross. But we serve a King who calls us to lay down our lives for a cause because we believe it's always okay to die for a cause, it's just never okay to kill for a cause. Well, we got a great team, so, but my, uh, usually my person I work really closely with, her name's Rebecca, she's she had to move to Nevada all of a sudden. From, from one o'clock Saturday afternoon until nine or nine thirty, the town was open for sale. And and when the stores closed, they wanted the blacks. Our town wasn't it to be that far. So uh, when when the stores were still going, but we went to a little house right near town, and if somebody ran in the building and said, your brother been shot, and he was killed by a white person, um, it was no hearing or no nothing, no going to court, no nothing. He was dead, and that was the end of that. You know, nothing, nobody's responsible, you know, and that's the way it was with all blacks back in those days, there were white sheriff. They was the law. That night when we left the hospital, and we all left and went to my mother's home, and there we are, you know, all the families there, and I just really felt like I needed to get away. I needed to get by myself and really, I was just in such agony to think about, had this really happened? Was Quezon really gone? So the only place I could find to go away from everyone was in the bathroom. So I go into the bathroom and I just sit down there in the bathroom and I just, I was, I could feel myself just moaning with, 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 with sorrow just to the point is, it's like, 
you don't know what's going to happen to you, you know, because it's so overwhelming. And as I'm sitting there, I feel a presence come into the bathroom with me. And all of a sudden, I hear a voice and says, have you forgiven? And have you considered forgiving? So it was like a suggestion and a question. Have you forgiven and have you considered forgiving? And I heard this voice from the inside and the outside of me. And I had never experienced this before. So as I'm sitting there, I'm like, God, is that you? Are you asking me to forgive? And in that, I was like, yes, God, I'll forgive. And it was, it was, it was so such a divine presence that I was taken back by it. But I knew that saying yes was my was to be my answer. <laughs> In him we live, we move, we have our being. And the whole idea here, this that we might seek after God. The idea here, we might seek after God. And once we know Him, we'll know He's present. Walking into the prison, I froze. And that's when Raymond was sitting uh, in the middle room waiting for us to come in um, to the actual dialogue and I froze right at the door. He stood up when he seen me at the door and he dropped his head. And when he stood up, it really showed me um, a respect that came from him. The first thing he said immediately to me was, I messed up, I messed up. And he puts his hand on his chest and he says, the only thing I'm worried about right now is having a heart attack. He said, because my chest is hurting so bad and he was crying uncontrollably. I, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yeah. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. And it's all by that amazing grace. Amazing grace. And that's what I'm talking about now, is the amazingness of grace. And I'm an old hymn that says, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else would help, love lifted me. I think that's where we gotta go. In that same year is when I received a card from Raymond that was a Mother's Day card and in that Mother's Day card he was just saying giving me um, you know my Mother Day wishes but also in that card he had asked me would I be his mother and that was something that was <laughs> it was honorable you know it, you know I was flattered and I knew the fact of you know what he needed as a young boy that uh, going into prison at 15 years old and not really having that support of a mother or a father. I knew his situation and then I also knew my heart's compassion for him, my forgiveness for him and toward him. But it was very difficult for me to answer that question, mm -hmm. you know, because of who he was and what he had done. And at the time of the dialogue, which was three years later, I told Raymond that I do accept you as my son and that we will work through this process and that we will learn one another. We will build a relationship. We have established a relationship now and we talk uh, probably four or five times a week. One of our friends, she's on the board of Rock Schools now, but she's, she lost her sisters to 
the shooting at New Life Church in Colorado Springs. I don't know if that reached out here, that news, but Ted Haggard's church. And uh, she's coming to speak. And I missed a call from her at 2 a.m. last night. It's like, oh no. Like something was wrong with her booking. I was worried. She's all good. Hey Terry, Terry, to my knowledge, we're not leaving anything here, right? No. Okay, personal stuff, we're not leaving at all. Not here. Okay, good. We, we improvised the table, Shane. That's why I left it in the car. Poncho, there's a t-shirt, okay. different sizes. Every year at Middle Church, we celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We do it because he was an incredible humanitarian and great civil rights leader. But we also do it because we understand that his death makes all of us responsible for making peace in the United States. What, what I mean by that is the civil rights movement that was so anchored in his leadership now has to be diffuse. Someone might say, do we need another hero? Well, yeah, all of us are heroes. All of us are responsible. What's fascinating to me about that, that day in April, that horrible day in April, is right before uh, the shooting happened, Dr. King was kind of roughing around with his friends, like grown men. They had been out to lunch, they were standing around talking, somebody came back in with a report that, that things were all set for the evening event and they were having a pillow fight, a pillow fight in the Lorraine Motel these big grown men. Dr. King goes back outside again, leans over the balcony and tells the musician to play Precious Lord. Play Precious Lord for me tonight and play it pretty. And then the shot rings out and he's, and he's dead. When he was killed, I was almost nine years old. It was a month before my birthday and the city of Chicago erupted in violence. Just fires and, and looting and so much horrible reaction to this man of peace killed so violently. It might sound crazy, certainly precocious, but when I was under my bed hiding from flying bullets, I knew that I was supposed to pick up his work. And what I want to say is, I think we're all supposed to pick up his work. I got it. Okay, and then if you could just stand right behind that bag. Test, one, two, three, here we are. All right, old first reform, demand the ban. 
My name's Shane Claiborne, and I'm one of the organizers. We've got a great team. I'm one of the organizers here for an event we've been calling Demand the Ban. We really have a singular focus today, which is uh, banning uh, automatic, semi-automatic weapons, assault rifles from our streets. Military-style weapons are designed for one purpose, to kill as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And that's exactly what they're being used for over and over again. So the exact weapon that we are using today is not random. It's an AR-15, and that's the weapon of choice that in guns like it that are being used, but it was used in Aurora, it was used in Sandy Hook. This is taking something that keeps being used over and over to take so much life and we're turning it into uh, garden tools this morning. So there's a bill before Congress and that's why we're delivering the plow to Senator Toomey. I think we're actually giving him a softball pitch, you know, and we said if you come out today and you say I'm in, you know, to banning assault weapons, then this protest will turn into a party. What Martin Luther King said about direct action is that what we, what it does is it exposes injustice um, in a way that makes people uncomfortable and it makes it impossible to ignore. We are willing to put our bodies down and to risk arrest um, for this. I mean, we, our goal is not to go to jail. Our goal is to go in, deliver a plow, and have Senator Toomey say, I'm, I'm all on board, you know, um, for banning assault weapons. You know, for people that are believers, they understand what I'm saying. But for people that are non-believers, you know, when I tell them this story, they go, oh, okay, that's nice. But I remember for those six to eight weeks after Jordan was murdered, I always say, I was not on this earth plane. I truly was somewhere in between heaven and earth. I can remember when I was coming out of that space and I can just remember myself felt like I was falling from that space and I was I remember praying Lord please 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 no I want to stay here I want to stay where I am I don't I don't want to come back down I don't want to feel the pain I don't want to go through the angst and the trauma I can't believe this has happened to to Jordan you know I don't want to have to figure out why this has happened to Jordan. I don't want to be here. That because I started questioning God when I came out of that space. I was like, but why did you let this happen? You know, you promised me that you would take care of Jordan. You promised me that, you know, he would have a long, fruitful life. You promised me those things, but why would you take him from me? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you know, he's my child. He's my child. And I started praying, you know, show me, Father, who I am now. Where am I to go? You know, what am I to do with my life now? And the Holy Spirit there again let me know, you're still Jordan's mother. But the work that you're going to be doing now, you'll continue to parent him, but just in a different form. And I'm, you know, you're being called to parent other sons and daughters. So that is my life now. I'm still parenting Jordan through his legacy, the work that I do in trying to save other people and other children from the senseless kind of violence that Jordan died from. And the central and key figure in all of that has been my faith in God. I don't know what I would have done had I not been so attached to the Lord. I meet victims all the time, I meet parents all the time that don't know the God that I serve. And they're so lost and they're angry and they're entrenched in hate and that bondage. And my heart bleeds for them because they don't have to be there. They don't have to be entrenched in that bondage. They can be set free in spite of in spite of my loss i have still been set free i've been set free of the bondage of unforgiveness hate anger the pain because i know that my boy has been set free of course i'd rather have him here but as a mother as a parent as a believer, 
I'm happy that he's been set free. chop saw too because I forgot to pack that. Oh. I, I'm going to a separate thing tomorrow, another raw tools thing, and so I, I forgot a little bit of that and I forgot a little bit of this. <laughs> just, just lay that over it. You know, it's, it's funny because I think a lot of people would consider me a progressive or even a liberal theologian based on my views on the Bible, on same-sex marriage, and stuff like that. And yet, people are a lot of times surprised to find a liberal theologian who's also a hunter and a, and a gun owner, which is what I am. You know, I, a lot of my friends don't hunt, don't have firearms, and uh, they find it odd that I own like four shotguns and I have a gun safe in my basement, you know, um, and that I'm teaching my kids how to shoot guns and that two of my three kids have been through hunter safety. And I think my friends who don't own firearms are really missing out, honestly. I have come in contact with God through through nature and through the hunting experience in a way that I never have through other endeavors of my life. I mean, I find, I find experience of God when I read the Bible, obviously when I'm with my kids and my spouse, for sure, when I go to church, but there is something about, like sitting in a duck blind, for instance, where you are there at sunrise and all of your senses are completely heightened. Like you, you hear every twig snap in the forest. You can hear, once you've been duck hunting a while, you can hear the whistle, the particular whistle of duck wings. And if you've really been hunting a while, you can tell what kind of duck is coming based on that whistle that they make. There's something about hunting that is unlike anything else I do in my life, and that is, it commands my total and 100% attention. And there's nothing else I do that I can be writing a book and also like I have Twitter on, like Twitter pops up on my phone or my phone, you know, somebody texts me, oh, I'll, you know, bop, 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 I'll, I'll return that text and then I'll get back to my book. And, you know, my kids will come down and be like, well, should we have mac and cheese for lunch or what? You know, when I'm hunting, between all the other guys, all the firearms, all the dogs, and this field, and there's pheasants in that high, you know, uh, switch grass you're, you're walking through. You can't be, you can't afford to be anything but totally focused on that event. And I am sure that for our ancestors who didn't have, you know, phones and didn't have cars and didn't have all the things we have. I'm sure there were a lot of things they did. I'm sure that the Native Americans who hunted buffalo on the plains where I now hunt pheasants had that experience a lot. 
where they were just totally locked in on one thing, hunting a buffalo. And uh, I don't have that in my life, except when I hunt. on this side we're, we're going to start in about five or ten minutes and uh everything's going to be projecting this way so you can gather out that way all right we'll start in just a few minutes thanks for being here i'm being followed by the rain cloud my clothes are soaking up the pain that keeps pouring down too much more and i may drown Followed by the night sky It stole away my sight It seems I have lost my way I need someone to be my guide Listen to my voice Close your frightened eyes Hide behind my love for you Fear's only a choice one that we all must make someday So know you're not alone in this I think everybody knows that the way that this is going to roll today is we're going to have a rally here. We're going to hear from several different faith voices, people that have been directly affected by gun violence, and we're doing something over here we're going to tell you about in a second and then we're going to march in a little bit from here down to chestnut street to senator toomey's office if you don't have a poster we've got hundreds of them up here they have the names of the folks that have died in the most recent uh mass shootings by assault rifles uh so carry those with you you can come get one right now but we're going to get this going and you know it's important to remember that just yesterday there was another double murder in North Philadelphia. Two people that were killed. A reminder that there are 90 lives a day at stake right now, over 30,000 a year, and this is not okay. And so we've got a special group of folks here called Raw Tools. They're blacksmiths. They're working right now on a gun. I want to bring up my buddy who's the founder. Welcome Mike Martin, the founder of Raw Tools. By the way, if you didn't catch that, raw tools is war flipped backwards. Can somebody say amen, all right? Amen. So tell us a little about raw tools and what we're doing today, bro. Well, we're based out of Colorado Springs. We always partner with Shane whenever he's up to something here. We brought it along with us, this AR-15 that was donated by a mother in Colorado Springs. She gave us five guns that she inherited from her father. And instead of keeping them and having somebody find them that shouldn't find them or putting them back into the gun market, She's having them all turned into garden tools. So if you, if you donate a gun to us, you get a garden tool for free out of that gun. So that's how we want to flip this around. We're going to have the after of what we made out of that in just a minute. It's being made right now. But we did want you to see, and it's heavy, right? It's, it's heavy on our hearts. But we want you to see what these things look like before we cut them and before we transform them. So Movita is going to talk about this right here. So my name is Movita Johnson Harrell. I'm the founder of the Charles Foundation, a partner with Heating Guys Call, Delco United, Simple Way, and Raw Tools. And we're here today for one simple reason, because we hashtag demand the ban. I went into a gun shop on Saturday saying, let me see if I can buy a gun. I walked into the gun shop from the time I signed the background check to the time I signed the bill of purchase. It was 4.5 minutes four and a half minutes to buy a semi-automatic AR-15 and he tried to sell me bullets and when I said I'm using it as a prop he said well I can sell you blanks so you get the real sound. This is disgusting in this nation that someone could just walk in and there's boxes that you check right so am I mentally ill? Check. Am I a domestic abuser? Check. <laughs> 
Am I a felon? Check. But sometimes they don't know. So someone could go into a gun shop like Parkland, like Las Vegas, and legally buy a gun and murder children. We can't go to the mall. We can't go to the park. We can't go to school. Where can we go? This doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. Remember this, 4.5 minutes. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican, in that order, and I'm a card-carrying member of the NRA. The reality is, throughout American history, it's been proven time and time again, firearms in the hands of law-abiding citizens makes our communities more safe, not less. Because the quickest way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. They use their media to assassinate real news. They use their schools to teach children that their president is another Hitler. They use their movie stars and singers and comedy shows and award shows to repeat their narrative over and over again. And then they use their ex-president to endorse the resistance, all to make them march, make them protest, make them scream racism and sexism and xenophobia and homophobia, to smash windows, burn cars, shut down interstates and airports, bully and terrorize the law abiding, until the only option left is for the police to do their jobs and stop the madness. And when that happens, they'll use it as an excuse for their outrage. The only way we stop this, the only way we save our country and our freedom is to fight this violence of lies with the clenched fist of truth. I'm the National Rifle Association of America, and I'm freedom's safest place. I'm freedom's safest place. This is the problem. The problem of they. Who are they? Who are they? So violence has come from the brokenness of humanity and us trying to create a Christianity that keeps one more important than the other one. We are violating the very law of God. You're violating the very intention of God on earth when we try to make one person inferior to the other one. And then it works on us both in suicidal. Black folks are killing people in my ghettos one by one. White folks are going into churches, schools, theaters, and killing them with machine guns. This is genocide. That's what is self-hatred. That's what leads to you trying to say, I'm nothing, when God said you are dignified. You are created in my image. And so the good news of the gospel is that, that I love you so much that I came to redeem you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We're going to perish with these guns that we made. The research tells us that 90% of NRA members agree with universal background checks. 
The research tells us that an overwhelming majority of NRA members do not believe in the illegal uh, trafficking of weapons between and across states because of straw purchases. So I would tell NRA members, um, number one, become more vocal about the things we agree on rather than allow the radical minority of the NRA to paralyze every conversation related to the common sense regulation of access to firearms, particularly weapons of war that make their way into our communities. The second thing that I would tell an NRA member is NRA members have to begin to reckon with the anger, fear, and pain that is packaged and sold to them by NRA executives who are making money. They're profiting off of your anger, your fear, your pain, or your pleasure. I absolutely believe in people's Second Amendment right to hunt, be gun enthusiasts. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. There are lots of law-abiding people in this country that are hunters, that are guns and gun enthusiasts, that are gun collectors. There's nothing wrong with that. But there are an element of people in the country that are using their guns improperly and as a means to carry out their extremist agenda for hate and fear of others that don't look, think, or act like they do. That's not right. That's against the word of God. So there again, it's not a matter of trying to take your guns away and take away guns from law-abiding individuals that are using them properly. Absolutely, you have a right to. But when you have a whole demographic of people in the, in the country that want to use their guns maliciously because they know that the gun laws are so expansive that allow them to do so, We've got to address that. One of my goals is to bring people together. I want to engage, not enrage either side. I wanna, I wanna help people to be able to talk civilly about these things without everybody getting upset. So it just sounded like you guys were a good match to just sit and just talk. I carry, and I've carried for years. Uh, I do not support every person carrying. I take this very responsibly as well. Um, it bothers me that I could walk into the uh, licensing bureau and the firing range in Tennessee if I'm 90 years old, I'm not far from that, <laughs> that I can barely walk, but yet I can go in there and take a 15 minute test and walk out on the firing range and fire at a range of about 25 feet or 25 yards at the most and maybe hit the target and be given permission to carry with no training. That bothers me. I believe in the right of every person to be able to carry weapons but I don't think we ought to be so free and easy as to how we allow them to do that. And I, it scares me to think of the number of people in our nation today who carry and are not trained and don't know uh, these things. So I'm not for a free and open uh, carry, but I am for a free and open right to carry. I would think, I'm not a veteran, but I would think for you as a veteran and as a person who works with veterans and uh, you teach on this subject, when you see, when you've seen firsthand the horrors of war, when you see the immediate and acute and chronic consequences, you would be much more willing than most people to say, let's invest in the long-term conditions that make for peace. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's how you feel. That's exactly how I feel. Yeah. But meanwhile, I have to deal with the world as it is, not yeah. what I want it to be. Yeah. And 
and holding that balance. Yes. And this seems to me to be our problem. If we only argue about when the desperate situation comes up, when somebody's running with a knife to kill you or running with a gun to kill your wife or something, we, we have those desperate situations. But if we, nev if we only deal with the desperate situations and never deal with the conditions, Absolutely. Um, we're, we're going to keep having those desperate situations. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where I think we, as Christians especially, have to take much more seriously Jesus' call to be peacemakers by sowing the seeds of peace. I, I think of Jesus weeping for Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you knew the things that make for peace. I was about to say that. Yeah. You know who else said that too as they looked over Jerusalem? God in Hosea. Yeah. If only you knew peace. And he says, my heart recoils in me to have to destroy this nation. But he did. He did. And sometimes, mm. as much as we hate to, we have to. Mm. And all the while, living in a state of repentance. Ten years ago, my family was leaving our home church after our service to go to lunch. We had just had our weekly argument about where we were going to eat, and we were all eager to get to lunch. I had climbed in the back of our family minivan, and my sister Rachel was standing outside um, putting something in her bag, and all of a sudden I heard a sound like a balloon popping. I spun around to look, and I couldn't see anything. Um, but then chaos erupted as um, windows on the minivan were shot out and my dad screamed at us to get down because someone was shooting at us. A man who carried a lot of unprocessed pain and anger carried an XM-15 semi-automatic assault rifle armed with that anger and killed two of my three sisters that day. Eight years later, in the fall of 2015, my friend Noah, whose family I considered my own, went off of his medications for bipolar disorder and attempted to treat it on his own. He began to take an experimental medication which caused him to have a psychotic break. His stepdad and brother were on a plane to have an intervention with him. When he picked up his AR-15, left his house only a block and a half away from me, and killed three people on the street nearby before being taken down by police. This is America in which I have been a survivor of gun violence and in which I have known a perpetrator. The Second Amendment does not confer the right to keep and bear arms. If you look at it carefully, it does not confer the right to keep and bear arms. It defends that right. It affirms that right because he says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed which means that this is a right that existed before the Second Amendment was crafted. It's an inherent right, and the founders believe that these rights, every inherent right is a right that comes to us as a gift from a Creator God. So it's one of the rights, along with the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, the right to defend oneself, that's a right that's bestowed on us by the Creator, which means that there is no agency, there's no human being, there's no human agency that has the moral authority or the ethical authority to take that right away from us because it's a gift to us from God. Think of the compressed rage that goes into an assault weapon, a weapon of war. Think of the compressed trauma. And we give this into the hands of people who carry rage unhealed inside of them and it becomes a tool. The cycle continues. I think the bright line for me is if the government is trying to disarm American citizens, is trying to confiscate their guns, is trying to make guns illegal, trying to take guns away from people, then they're infringing on a God-given right that's protected in the Second Amendment of the Constitution. Rage is not quickly or easily healed. We must grieve both our personal and collective histories fully and deeply in order to heal. But on that journey, we can easily remove a weapon that in the hands of rage causes immeasurable damage. You know, I'm fine with a ban on uh, automatic weapons, machine guns. I'm fine with that. You don't need one of those for self-defense. But when it comes to start disarming people 
of handguns and rifles like the AR-15, well, that's, that's a different thing because those genuinely are weapons that can be used in self-defense. In our pursuit of transformation, I ask now that we remove this weapon of terrorism and ban its access while continuing to address rage and its healing. And now it is time to take our rage, our outrage at these incidents, our carried rage about them, and transform our rage into demanding a ban. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. So this is uh, the moment we get to see what has been made live in real time out of an AR-15. Are you ready? This is, uh, this is what we started with. And literally in the last hour, this is what you've made out of that. You know, sometimes people point out that Jesus, just before he went into the garden, um, he said, uh, um, if you don't have any swords, go out and sell what you need to in order to buy some. And so people say, well, look at there, Jesus is telling, you know, arm up. It's time to arm up. Uh, it's found in Luke 22. Now, the disciples respond by saying, oh, we, we've got two swords. And Jesus says, okay, that's enough. Now, if, if you're actually planning on taking on uh, the temple guard, you're going to need more than two swords. So something's going on here. Why, 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 why are two enough? Uh, why did Jesus say this? And note that when Peter used one of those swords to defend Jesus, Jesus rebukes him, which clearly means Jesus never intended them to use those swords. You know, and, and I believe I am following Jesus in my view because there's a verse that most people overlook, most Christians overlook. It's Luke 22, 36, where Jesus tells his disciples, this was the night on which he was betrayed and then crucified the next day. He tells his disciples, look, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak, which is the most valuable piece of clothing they had, sell your cloak and buy one. The answer is found in the very next verse. The very next verse uh, in Luke 22. Um, he says, for it is written, and then he quotes Matthew 50, or Isaiah 53, uh, that uh, the Son of Man must be accounted among the transgressors, transgressors or insurrectionists. So he's telling his own disciples, you guys need to arm yourselves in your own defense. And the reason he went on to say is for the scripture is going to be fulfilled in me that says he was numbered with the transgressors. The temple guard had to have reason, just cause, to bring him in as a, a rebel. Well, you can't, it's harder to make a case that the person's a rebel if they don't have any kind of uh, weapons. Uh, he, they, he has to at least give the appearance of being arrestable, you know? And, and so by having these two swords, especially when you got one hothead who's willing to use it, uh, well, that would justify the temple guard arresting him. So it's to fulfill this prophecy and to ensure that he will get arrested that Jesus has carried these swords. So he says to the apostles, look, I'm going to be numbered with the transgressors. You are identified with me, so you too will be thought of as a transgressor, as a, an enemy of public order and safety. So you need to have a sword, an instrument of self-defense, to be able to protect yourself because there may, people that, there may be people that come after you just because you are identified with me and are a follower of me. And I, as your rabbi, as your master, I'm instructing you to prepare yourself in case that day comes. As Christians, we ought to thank God for Luke 22, 36, because that clarifies that Jesus was a supporter of bearing arms in self-defense. So all of us that have committed to organizing this action want to be very clear that violence is the problem, not the solution. Don't resist an evil person, Matthew 5:39. Now, he uses that word resist, uh, it, it's anthistamy. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're supposed to just say, hey, do whatever evil you want. Uh, but it has the connotation of don't push back. Don't, it's not a push for push, uh, a hit for a hit, or a shot for a shot. Uh, don't respond in kind. Uh, you can get in the way of an evildoer, uh, you know, to lay down your life uh, to prevent that from happening, but you're not allowed to engage in any re re retaliatory violence towards them or violence of any sort. Today, we make the following commitments. We will con contemplate and practice the teachings of the great champions of nonviolence. Yes, we will. Love your enemies, bless those who persecute you, pray for those who despitefully use you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Now note that, he makes this the criteria for being considered a child of the Father in heaven. 
Today, we will remember always that the nonviolent movement seeks justice and reconciliation, not just victory. Yes, yes we will. He causes his sun, the sun, uh, to shine on the just and the unjust, and the rain to fall on the righteous and the wicked. And so we're to love like that. The rain falls indiscriminately, the sun shines indiscriminately, the Father loves indiscriminately. And so when we love indiscriminately and refuse to retaliate, refuse to engage in violence, we're putting on display His character, and that's why we can be considered children of the Father in heaven. We're to be like this because God is like this. Today, we will walk and talk in the manner of love. Yes, we will. We will seek daily for all people to be set free from violence and hatred. Yes, we will. That's the power of God. It's the power of self-sacrificial love. It's not the power of coercion or determinism or violence. It's the, it's the, it's the power to love even your enemies. And that's the only thing that can possibly transform enemies into friends and bring about reconciliation, which is what God does with us when we were enemies of His. Of course, guns don't kill people on their own, but guns are a tool, and every tool that we have as human beings shapes how we think as human beings. Think about a cell phone that people have. Once you have a mobile phone in your pocket, you think about communicating and acting and interacting with people differently. Once you have a car available to you, you think about traveling as a teenager. Now I can get out, I can get away, I can break free. Once you have money that's available to you, we think about spending it differently. Because all of those tools shape how we think. And if you have a tool that's designed for violence and for destruction and for killing, it starts to shape how you think. It's not as if the tool is neutral, the tool has a power on us. Think about firearms and the fact that there are more firearms in our country than human beings. I, I think the word epidemic is appropriate. Uh, I think fixation, like it's an odd fixation with these, these tools that were actually designed to keep people distant from one, an, from one another and to solve problems from a distance, hopefully by eliminating whoever your enemy might be. There's all this conversation about how guns don't kill people, people do. But the truth of the matter is, guns don't get it by themselves and get in the hands of someone and shoot themselves. The truth of the matter is, guns make it easy for violence to be ramped up, amped up, and to feel almost as impersonal as email, because you're far away and you point it and you shoot. So if you think about a gun, like a gun is a little tiny machine that's designed to, to force a projectile, a little pointy metal piece uh, through the air at such a speed that it can, it can rip through flesh, tear apart organ, organs, and blow out the back of a, of a human body so that I actually don't have to deal with you. because of preventable violence at the systemic, structural, and interpersonal level is an act of sin, and it is something the church must own as our primary function as we declare the good news of Jesus to the world. 
How can we save souls if bodies are already dead? All right, the first thing I want you all to do is to take a look, look around at one of the t-shirts. These are people I don't know and you didn't know, but every single one of them had a family, neighbors, co-workers, and so on. It's for people like this that we're here, to remember them, the lives that they could have lived, and to commit ourselves to make sure this sort of thing stops. For some strange reason, God doesn't want to change the world without us. And if we hold our hands up at God and we say, God, why don't you do something? God may be looking back at us and saying, I did do something. I made you. On November 22nd, 1994, my brother Mike, an FBI agent, was sitting at a desk in Washington, D.C., Metropolitan Head Police Headquarters. I don't think you could come up with a safer place to be. A man walked in up to the second floor with a Mac 10, pulled his Mac out, started firing, killed Mike with the first bullet. So when people say, all we can do is pray, after another mass shooting, all we can do is pray. It's a lie. Only in America do we allow people to get and carry around the kind of firepower it took to easily, easily overwhelm a room full of trained and armed police officers. We can pray and we've got to pray, but we can do more than just pray. This is unacceptable. We don't need to accept it. That, that's one of the things they said about slavery is all we can do is pray. I'm glad people did more than just pray. I serve in Washington, D.C., where I'm a minister to elected and appointed officials, and Senator Toomey is in my parish. And I plan to walk over there tomorrow and check to see if he has his plowshare. And I want to remind him of the 300-plus folks that came out today in the rain to help exercise his conscience. Of every social movement that's changed society, before it happened, everybody said it's impossible. And after it happened, everybody said it was inevitable. These instruments are designed for a purpose. Mass killing of human beings. Yes. There is no other purpose behind the engineering of these instruments of death. It's been said that the person who hopes is changed by their own hope. We, we begin to live differently, especially when we're expecting something to change, like a, a mother that's expecting a baby doesn't just wait. They, she, you know, the mother and father start painting rooms and getting the crib ready and eating healthy and you know preparing. And, and in the same way, we, we know that we're giving birth to a different world than the world that we have right now. And so we, we, we begin to live in expectation of that. I'm going to speak <coughs> to the Christian conscience of Senator Toomey. Thank you. If being Christian means to be Christ-like, there is nothing Christ-like about these weapons. The early Christians actually took this image of the prophets of beating swords into plows and one after another you see them using it to say, this is our calling. Jesus Christ never used an earthly weapon. He preached, he taught, he modeled peace, humility, preferring the other before yourself. He said we must become like children. Children should never wield these weapons. We're called to transform the world, so every time we take a gun and turn it into a plow, it feels like we are transforming the world. If Senator Toomey 
wants to join me in attempting as best we can to follow the model of Jesus Christ, he will exercise moral courage and he will call to demand the ban. It says God's people will beat their swords into plows, their spears into pruning hooks. That uh, They don't wait on the politicians and the presidents and commanders and chiefs. It's the people that lead the politicians. It's the people that rise up and say, we refuse to kill. We are done with these weapons. And they begin to beat their own swords into plows. So that's what we're doing is we're not waiting on politicians and legislators. We're saying this is what God's up to and we're with God. What I would say to people that, you know, whichever side you fall on um, with this issue, if you're not able to look at the person that's in front of you that disagrees with you and see the humanity in that person or have empathy for that person or what they might have been through, then right there, that is a clear sign that you're in the wrong. Not that your ideals may be wrong, but where you are, how you're coming about this is wrong. Because if the issue is more important to you than people, then that is not right.